Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. Uh, my name is Zach, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, as usual we're going to be covering another chapter, actually the last two chapters, of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, that's our audiobook for the week. Let me just turn on the sound just a little bit. There we go. That should be all the way down. There we go. All right. Um, and so, but actually, before we get to chapters three and four, uh, there's one thing I wanted to get to that I missed last week. I, I don't know how I skipped over it, uh, but it's one of the most controversial and uh, um, consequential, I guess, parts of the entire Communist Manifesto, and that is the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. I don't know what I was doing at the time. I guess I was distracted by the game or something, but I just kind of breezed right by it. So we're going to go and play that uh, that one little section again, and then we'll, we'll comment on it just a little bit. And uh, after that, we'll skip ahead to chapters three and four. So after the, the chapters three and four, we'll, we'll kind of sum up some of the stuff that we've we've been talking about uh give you a little preview of, of what next week is going to be like and uh, i got some i got a new segment gonna shout out a few of the uh the uh, various leftist creators that that i find interesting give them a little plug uh so stay stay tuned to the end for that um otherwise we're going to get into uh, that one little section of chapter two And we're going to talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat. So, here we go. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. But let us have done with the bourgeois objections to communism. We have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling as to win the battle of democracy. So that right there, also known as the dictatorship of the proletariat, it's where the workers take over and, and uh, take the place of the ruling class. So it is, is a society ruled by its workers. Now, it's one of the most controversial things. People hear dictatorship and automatically they're like, oh my goodness, that, that sounds horrible, they imagine. Uh, Stalinist Russia or the Stalinist USSR. They imagine uh, many of the, the dictators that have been associated with uh, communism or socialism in the past. Uh, and that's not necessarily what, and that's not at all what, what Marx and Engels were talking about. I'll listen on and, and I'll tell you a little bit more. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degrees all capital from the bourgeoisie to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e. of the proletariat organized. Uh, so this, this might sound similar to uh, what the Chinese have right now, which is, in my opinion, more a state capitalism. So the state controls all the capital in the country. What that doesn't mean in, in what Marx is talking about is, is the way it has played out in places like China. Uh, where you have a party that's in control and everyone else that's not in control just kind of is at the whim of the party. What Marx was talking about was was actually um, having the workers democratically decide how to to control and distribute and produce all of the, the goods and services of uh, the economy. So it's, it's a bit different than, than the way it has played out and, you know, um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, uh, when you, when you have a revolution, it's always, there's always going to be that one moment where, um, there's a power vacuum and, and you're hoping that, that your side and that good people are going to fill that, that power vacuum, the people that actually believe in the revolution. But for one thing, that's not always the case. Uh, that can, it can just be the most ruthless and the most, uh, power hungry that, that goes for that grab. It could be uh, members of the uh, petty bourgeoisie or, the, the, or just working class people that, that want to usurp the, the uh, 
owner class and and take their place and at the same time all their power and just you switch places with them without actually remaking society um so there's that threat in in the midst of the, the fog of a revolution and then also even if you have uh the most benevolent benevolent and, and well-meaning of leaders for one thing it doesn't mean they're good at actually leading and organizing um once the revolution is done with, they, they could be completely sloppy and then just let things fall apart. Um, and then for another thing, just because you could have uh, everything move, work really well, uh, go very smoothly and have an actual dictatorship of the proletariat where all the workers democratically decide uh, how to, to produce and distribute all the, the goods and services of a nation but then, little by little, their power erodes. You know, people that are seeking power uh, take their place. Uh, in my opinion, that's kind of the sort of thing that happened with the USSR. You know, you had Lenin, who, by many accounts, really believed in the ideas that he espoused, believed in uh, a, more of a flattened out power structure. Uh, but then, you know, People are mortal. They don't live forever. And who took over after him? But Stalin, who reversed many of the progresses that he made in, in things like uh, gay marriage, like the USSR, I believe was one of the first, if not the first, nation to legalize gay marriage. But when Stalin came along, he, he did away with that. And Stalin uh, had more of a, an iron-fisted approach to wielding power. He didn't want any challenges to it. So there's always that threat uh, that when you centralize power into one place that eventually someone's going to come along and uh, do bad things with it, you know, reverse all the gains that you've made. And um, So that that sort of thing is, is what steered me away from, personally, from uh, the idea of a quick revolution, of uh, uh, a quick changing of, of power concentrating into the hands of all the people all at once and, and just having a lot of change all at once uh, that, that seems very volatile to me, very unstable. Uh, so kind of what I would prefer, just in my, in my own opinion, just from what I've read and, and the, the theories that I've come up with on my own, be more of what would be known as, or what could be known as, a, say, a small and slow revolution. There's a concept in permaculture uh, which I believe I mentioned in my first video, uh, use small and slow solutions. Uh, and that would be little by little building up power, little by little uh, converting people to your ideals. Because that's, that's another threat to any revolution, is you're always going to have counter-revolutionaries, the old guard that has a vested interest in keeping the status quo, who now are going to use whatever means they can uh, be it outside military influence or just whatever power they have to, to gain back control. So you always have that threat if things are done very quickly. If you do things in a more gradual and deliberate way where you're converting people to your ideas um, and then and little by little doing what you can under the current system, of course, you, we, you know, I don't, I'm not one to believe that we can get to any sort of actual socialism or communism or anarchy under the current system. Eventually it will take people doing away with the current system and, and putting in place a different one. But to get to that point, I think you have to reach some sort of a tipping point in the, in the psyche and the minds of people. Um, and I think that comes first and foremost through just education, through uh, just you know spreading ideas in a diversity of tactics. Um, some what it's going to come through doing what you can through electoralism and people don't like to hear that sort of thing a lot of leftists don't believe it all in electoralism they think it's just a waste of time but i mean it's hard to argue that nothing good can come from it certainly more harm can be prevented at the very least through exercising any sort of lever of power that's at your disposal and one of those levers of power in the system still is voting you know, especially local voting. You can uh, vote on ordinances. Say you want to raise chickens. You know, that, that ties into both permaculture and also can tie into things like mutual aid because then you have a product that you're producing yourself 
that you can share with your neighbors um, and, and help build those community bonds. But one thing that gets in the way of that a lot is local regulations, and that's where a new urbanism comes in. And knowing the local system of government and, and the ordinances that you need to change to uh, be able to enact the sort of systems that you want to be able to start building those those networks of mutual aid. So to say electoralism does nothing, ah, it's, a, it's a self-defeating point of view, in my opinion. And then you're just waiting around for every single person to just you know, spontaneously decide to revolt. Like, I don't, I don't think that's a really well thought out uh, strategy. Instead, doing what you can with what you have right now and slowly building power among your communities, building up strong communities. To me, that has a better chance of lasting because it's something that people have been used to. Uh, so after whatever you want to call it, after you, a revolution happens where uh, people decide to remake the system. Um, we're not talking necessarily even about a violent revolution, but uh, it can be a very peaceful one of people just, you know, Say, hey, we've been doing something very close to this for generations now. Why don't we just take the next step? Let's let's push past capitalism. Just push on through that left wall of it. Let's stop exploiting other countries. Like things are good for us, but hey, they can be good for everybody. Uh, and the more equal distribution of, of resources and, and power, that's just been the, the course of history. Uh, the the better people are off in general. Um, so, but, but to get to that point, I think takes a lot of slow and arduous building over generation and generation and generation and just spreading ideas in whatever way you can, whether that's through debates, whether that's through doing what I'm doing, just helping people get to know theory better and, and think some of these problems through and, and apply them to their lives and not be afraid of, of terms that in the past have been just used, thrown around as, as scare words by political opponents um so yeah so that, that that's my take on a revolution and getting to the point where any of these ideas could actually start to be implemented um let's continue on just as the ruling class and to increase the total of productive forces as rapidly as possible of course in the beginning this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of property and on the conditions of bourgeois production, by means of measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which, in the course of the movement, outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order, and are unavoidable as a means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. These measures will, of course, be different in different countries. Nevertheless, in the most advanced countries, the following will be pretty generally applicable. 1. Abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. 2. A heavy progressive or so graduated... So doing away with renting, rent, sink, rent seekers, uh, landlords. All right of inheritance. Yep. Four, I talked about this last time. So now we're back into the point where I had actually picked it up last time. Uh, so if you want to see more about what I said about uh, this sort of, or this part of it, uh, might as well just go back and, and play the last video. So we're going to go back and open the game. And there we are. So again, we're playing Majesty. Um, and just to, to reiterate, there we go. And just to reiterate, uh, this game is a real-time strategy, but instead of uh, directly telling your, your little minions what to do, you recruit them and they have their own free will. And you have to motivate them through rewards and through orders to, to build buildings or repair or whatever, what have you. Uh, so it's a little bit of an, a different take. So uh, let's get into it and let's start the let's start up chapter three. We're gonna go. Skip ahead then to chapter three. And it doesn't even list chapter four in this, so it's just gonna go right into the last chapter. I don't think there's much ceremony because it only is uh, a few sentences for the very last bit. It's just kind of a 
it's like your closing statement in like a five paragraph essay. Um, Section three. It's very, very short. So three and four, here we go. Wrapping stuff up. And once again, I encourage you to go to LibriVox. Uh, you can see it up on, on screen there, L-I-B-R-I uh, Vox. I'll go to the website, go to their, their app, all sorts of open, or not open source, so public domain, uh, free to use, free to listen to audiobooks, um, and you can even contribute your own if you're so inclined. So I very much, um, I very much encourage you to go check them out, LibriVox. The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Section three, socialist and communist literature. One, reactionary socialism. Feudal socialism. Owing to their historical position, it became the vocation of the aristocracies of France and England to write pamphlets against modern bourgeois society. In the French Revolution of July 1830, and in the English Reform Education, these aristocracies again succumbed to the hateful upstart. Thenceforth, a serious political contest was altogether out of the question. A literary battle alone remained possible. But even in the domain of literature, the old cries of the Restoration period had become impossible. In order to arouse sympathy, the aristocracy were obliged to lose sight, apparently, of their own interests, and to formulate their indictment against the bourgeoisie in the interest of the exploited working class alone. Thus the aristocracy took their revenge by singing lampoons on their new master and whispering in his ears sinister prophecies of coming catastrophe. In this way arose feudal socialism, half lamentation, half lampoon, half echo of the past, half menace of the future. At times, by its bitter, witty, and incisive criticism, striking the bourgeoisie to the very heart's core, but always ludicrous in its effect, through total incapacity to comprehend the march of modern history. The aristocracy, in order to rally the people to them, waved the proletarian alms bag in front for a banner. But the people, so often as it joined them, saw on their hindquarters the old feudal coats of arms, and deserted with loud and irreverent laughter. One section of the French legitimists and young just England just exhibited the spectacle, that in pointing out that their mode of exploitation was different to that of the bourgeoisie. The feudalists forget that they exploited under circumstances and conditions that were quite different and that are now antiquated. In showing that, under their rule, the modern proletariat never existed, they forget that the modern bourgeoisie is the necessary offspring of their own form of society. For the rest, so little do they conceal the reactionary character of their criticism that their chief accusation against the bourgeoisie amounts to this that under the bourgeois regime a class is being developed which is destined to cut up root and branch the old order of society. What they upbraid the bourgeoisie with is not so much that it creates a proletariat as that it creates a revolutionary proletariat. In political practice, therefore, they join in all coercive measures against the working class, and in ordinary life, despite their highfalutin phrases, they stoop to pick up the golden apples dropped from the tree of industry and to barter truth, love, and honor for traffic in wool, beetroot sugar, and potato spirits. As the parson has ever gone hand in hand with the landlord, so has clerical socialism with feudal socialism. Nothing is easier than to give Christian asceticism a socialist tinge. Has not Christianity declaimed against private property? against marriage, against the state? Has it not preached in the place of these charity and poverty, celibacy and mortification of the flesh, monastic life and mother church? Christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart burnings of the aristocrat. B. Petty Bourgeois Socialism the feudal aristocracy was not the only class that was ruined by the bourgeoisie, 
nor the only class whose conditions of existence pined and perished in the atmosphere of modern bourgeois society. The medieval burgesses and the small peasant proprietors were the precursors of the modern bourgeoisie. In those countries which are but little developed, industrially and commercially, these two classes still vegetate side by side with the rising bourgeoisie. In countries where modern civilization has become fully developed, a new class of petty bourgeois has been formed, fluctuating between proletariat and bourgeoisie and ever renewing itself as a supplementary part of bourgeois society. The individual members of this class, however, are being constantly hurled down into the proletariat by the action of competition, and, as modern industry develops, they even see the moment approaching when they will completely disappear as an independent section of modern society, to be replaced, in manufactures, agriculture, and commerce, by overlookers, bailiffs, and shopmen. In countries like France, where the peasants constitute far more than half of the population, it was natural that writers who sided with the proletariat against the bourgeoisie should use, in their criticism of the bourgeois regime, the standard of the peasant and petty bourgeois, and from the standpoint of these intermediate classes should take up the cudgels for the working class. Thus arose petty bourgeois socialism. Sismondi was the head of this school, not only in France, but also in England. This school of socialism dissected with great acuteness the contradictions in the conditions of modern production. It laid bare the hypocritical apologies of economists. It proved incontrovertibly the disastrous of... So they're talking here about the, he's going to go into the, the different forms of uh, socialism of his day. And from what I gather, what, what sounds like what he's talking about with his version of modern socialism, um, or, or the version of socialism that was prevalent in his day, or the various forms, uh, sound a lot like what we would call today social democracy. Um, so their solution is to work within the system completely, uh, just reform, 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 have uh, robust social programs, and uh, that sort of thing. They, they see that as the remedy to the ills of the, the working class. So he's calling them socialists. I mean, today, sure, people that disagree with uh, social democrats are going to label them. I mean, even Joe Biden got labeled a, a socialist. They will label anyone who is... Who is uh, left of Reagan or, or Thatcher, uh, a socialist at this point, anyone who's not, you know, I mean, even Joe Biden, very, very neoliberal in, in virtually all of his rhetoric. He's only been able to be pushed to, uh, to adopt some more progressive policies at all. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's, that's the way I think that you should probably read that when he's talking about these very socialist groups of his day. Is is more of a social democrat rather than a, a true socialist, because you know these these terms were amorphous then. They're they're still somewhat amorphous now. There's a lot of different definitions of them, and that's okay. We can we can keep things in a in a place that's not completely rigidly defined and uh, bordered, and, and still have a good understanding of, of the sort of things that we want and the sort of things we believe in. Effects of machinery and division of labor concentration of capital and land in a few hands, overproduction and crises. It pointed out the inevitable ruin of the petty bourgeois and peasant, the misery of the proletariat, the anarchy in production, the crying inequalities in the distribution of wealth, the industrial war of extermination between nations, the dissolution of old moral bonds, of the old family relations, of the old nationalities. In its positive aims, however, this form of socialism aspires either to restoring the old means of production and of exchange, and with them the old property relations and the old society, or to cramping the modern means of production and of exchange within the framework of the old... So, uh, so we've got a comment here. Tell me more about the types of socialism. Uh, well, I think I just described what Marx is talking about, the different types of his contemporaries who were competing and calling themselves socialists uh, in, in the modern day, what socialism, at least to, to my mind, I, I go by uh, the Richard Wolff definition. Richard Wolff is an economist. 
um, and also a Marxist. And he jokingly says that, you know, the, the modern conception of socialism is when the government does stuff. And if they do a lot of stuff, it's uh, communism, you know, and he's, he's joking about that. That's not actually a useful definition of socialism at all. So what I would define socialism is today is uh, the workers owning the means of production as being the rule rather than the exception. So things like worker-owned cooperatives, where everyone gets a vote on things like safety and pay and working conditions and, and job description, workload, and uh, and as to where the the pro how and to who uh, profits get divvied up to. Um, that would be a worker cooperative. I think that is a socialist form. It would be market socialism because you're still um, participating in the free market and you're still relying on capitalist market goods to, to do your business. Like say you have a socialist, you have a worker owned cooperative that's a coffee shop. You're still likely going to be getting your, you know, your paper products from places that, you know, may still not treat the, the workers who are cutting down the trees very well. They're probably not going to be cooperatives as well. You know, somewhere in the supply chain, you're going to run into uh, worker exploitation. But so social, getting back to what socialism is today, I would say it's the workers owning the means of production in a meaningful way. That doesn't mean the government owning anything unless the people have a meaningful control over the government. If you have very direct democracies where you directly elect or you, all the people have a say in uh, political decisions, uh, Sure, that could be the government owning the means of production and people through the government owning the means of production. Um, but otherwise, it would be people doing things like uh, being a part of a cooperative. And then also the role of government being to provide for the basic needs of the people. Uh, so you have basic necessities of life, things like food and water and shelter and uh, education, transportation, community, um, and then along a subset of communication would be telecommunication. I think in the modern day, you cannot get by without internet access. It's how you get a job. It's how you participate in the, uh, the virtual public square. Um, so I think that's another basic necessity of modern life. Um, and, and so the role of the government is to provide those things at either very low cost so that anyone can afford them or, you know, free to, to people um, just by virtue of them being alive and being participant in society. Uh, so to me, that's that's what modern day socialism is. And then again, that's not necessarily what Marx was talking about. What he was talking about is uh, when he's criticizing his contemporaries is, is more... Um, social democracy strong robust strong robust social programs lots of welfare spending uh, it would be things like um, rent control rather than just doing away with landlords altogether it would be things like uh, low-cost education grants rather than just providing uh, education um, stuff like that that, that falls in. And, you know, even Medicare for all, that would still be something that there could be some overlap between socialism, because that would be socialized medicine, uh, and social democracy. Those, those, that's, that's one thing that does exist under social democracies. Pretty much every democracy, except for the United States, has socialized medicine. Funny how that works. The richest, well, or the wealthiest, I should say, country in the history of the world somehow doesn't have enough money to, to do what Mexico does and other very much less wealthy countries do, which is provide some level of universal health care. Funny that, huh? It's almost like they're lying. Anyway, again, I digress. Let's get, let's get back to it because we have a long ways to go still. We still have about 25 minutes property left. Property relations that have been and were bound to be exploded by those means. In either case, it is both reactionary and utopian. Its last words are, corporate guilds for manufacture, 
patriarchal relations in agriculture. Ultimately, when stubborn historical facts had dispersed all intoxicating effects of self-deception, this form of socialism ended in a miserable fit of the blues. C. German or True Socialism The socialist and communist literature of France, a literature that originated under the pressure of a bourgeoisie in power, and that was the expression of the struggle against this power, was introduced into Germany at a time when the bourgeoisie in that country had just begun its contest with feudal absolutism. German philosophers, would-be philosophers, and beaux esprit eagerly seized on this literature, only forgetting that when these writings immigrated from France into Germany, French social conditions had not immigrated along with them. In contact with German social conditions, this French literature lost all its immediate practical significance and assumed a purely literary aspect. Thus, to the German philosophers of the 18th century, the demands of the first French Revolution were nothing more than the demands of practical reason in general and the utterance of the will of the revolutionary French bourgeoisie signified in their eyes the law of pure will, of will as it was bound to be, of true human will generally. The world of the German literate consisted solely in bringing the new French ideas into harmony with their ancient philosophical conscience, or rather, in annexing the French ideas without deserting their own philosophic point of view. This annexation took place in the same way in which a foreign language is appropriated, namely, by translation. It is well known how the monks wrote silly lives of Catholic saints over the manuscripts on which the classical works of ancient heathendom had been written. The German literate reversed this process with the profane French literature. They wrote their philosophical nonsense beneath the French original. For instance, beneath the French criticism of the economic functions of money, they wrote alienation of humanity, and beneath the French criticism of the bourgeois state, they wrote dethronement of the category of the general, and so forth. The introduction of these philosophical phrases at the back of the French historical criticisms they dubbed philosophy of action, true socialism, German science of socialism, philosophical foundation of socialism, and so on. The French socialist and communist literature was thus completely emasculated, and since it seized in the hands of the German to express the struggle of one class with the other, he felt conscious of having overcome French one-sidedness and of representing not true requirements, but the requirements of truth, not the interests of the proletariat, but the interests of human nature, of man in general, who belongs to no class, has no reality, who exists all... See, just a little aside here. To, to me, this sort of thing where he's going through and, and throwing shade basically on all the other competing schools of thought... Uh, this is the less uh, practical part of this pamphlet. Um, I mean, maybe if you're really interested in the historical world that he grew up in, to, or that he came up in to understand his worldview a little bit better, it's interesting, but I think for modern-day purposes, all these different schools of thought that have either gone by the wayside or have been transformed in one way or another, uh, not particularly relevant or useful. So I'm probably not going to have a lot to say about this, this next little section for a bit here. Um, but if I think of anything, of course, I'll, I'll chime right in. Only in the misty realm of philosophical fantasy. This German socialism, which took its schoolboy task so seriously and solemnly, and extolled its poor stock in trade in such mountebank fashion, meanwhile gradually lost its pedantic innocence. The fight of the German, and especially of the Prussian bourgeoisie, against feudal aristocracy and absolute monarchy, in other words, the liberal movement became more earnest. By this, the long-wished-for opportunity was offered to true socialism of confronting the political movement with the socialist demands, of hurling the traditional anathemas against liberalism, against representative government, against bourgeois competition, 
bourgeois freedom of the press, bourgeois legislation, bourgeois liberty and equality, and of preaching to the masses that they had nothing to gain and everything to lose by this bourgeois movement. German socialism forgot, in the nick of time, that the French criticism, whose silly echo it was, presupposed the existence of modern bourgeois society, with its corresponding economic conditions of existence, and the political constitution adapted thereto, the very things whose attainment was the object of the pending struggle in Germany. To the absolute governments, with their following of parsons, professors, country squires, and officials, it served as a welcome scarecrow against the threatening bourgeoisie. It was a sweet finish after the bitter pills of floggings and bullets with which these same governments, just at that time, closed the German working-class risings. While this true socialism thus served the governments as a weapon for fighting the German bourgeoisie, it, at the same time, directly represented a reactionary interest, the interest of the German Philistines. In Germany, the petty bourgeois class, a relic of the 16th century, and since then constantly cropping up again under various forms, is the real social basis of the existing state of things. To preserve this class is to preserve the existing state of things in Germany. The industrial and political supremacy of the bourgeoisie threatens it with certain destruction. On Preserving the, hand, the same basic the order, of nothing capital, really changing. On the other, from the rise of Sound a revolutionary a proletariat. True socialism appeared to kill these two birds with one stone. It spread like an epidemic. The robe of speculative cobwebs, embroidered with flowers of rhetoric, steeped in the dew of sickly sentiment, this transcendental robe in which the German socialists wrapped their sorry eternal truths, all skin and bone, served to wonderfully increase the sale of their goods amongst such a public. And on its part, German socialism recognized, more and more, its own calling as the bombastic representative of the petty bourgeois Philistine. It proclaimed the German nation to be the model nation, and the German petty Philistine to be the typical man. To every villainous meanness of this model man, it gave a hidden, higher, socialistic interpretation, the exact contrary of its real character. It went to the extreme length of directly opposing the brutally destructive tendency of communism, and of proclaiming its supreme and impartial contempt of all class struggles. With very few exceptions, all the so-called socialist and communist publications that now, 1847, circulate in Germany, belong to the domain of this foul and enervating literature. 2. Conservative or Bourgeois Socialism A part of the bourgeoisie is desirous of redressing social grievances in order to secure the continued existence of bourgeois society. To this section belong economists, philanthropists, humanitarians, improvers of the conditions of the working class, organizers of charity, members of societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, temperance fanatics, hole and corner reformers of every imaginable kind. This form of socialism has, moreover, been worked out into complete systems. We may cite Proudhon's Philosophie de la Misère as an example of this form. And we will get to the Proudhon socialistic bourgeois eventually. want all the advantages of uh, modern social conditions without the second, struggles and dangers necessary. Uh, yeah, we're probably going to do as our second anarchist book, um, Proudhon's uh, "What Is Property." It's a very, it's kind of a dry book, but it's uh, very important for people that haven't thought too much about how property is. Uh, given its legitimacy uh, and how illegitimate pretty much all claims to property are. Um, and it also gets into the idea of, of paying people entirely, or the entire product of um, what they produce. So if you were, say, a fry cook, you would get the entirety of all of the profit that uh, cooking those fries gives to uh, your restaurant. Not just, you know, your hourly rate, you would get all of it, all the profit. 
So you take out expenses, whatever's left after that, that's yours. So that, that's Proudhon. He was a contemporary anarchist, considered the father of anarchy, um, contemporary of Karl Marx and a competing philosophy. Necessarily resulting therefrom. They desired the existing state of society minus its revolutionary and disintegrating elements. They wish for a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. The bourgeoisie naturally conceives the world in which it is supreme to be the best, and bourgeois socialism develops this comfortable conception into various more or less complete systems. In requiring the proletariat to carry out such a system, and thereby to march straightway into the social New Jerusalem, it but requires in reality that the proletariat should remain within the bounds of existing society, but should cast away all its hateful ideas concerning the bourgeoisie. A second and more practical, but less systematic, form of this socialism sought to depreciate every revolutionary movement in the eyes of the working class by showing that no mere political reform, but only a change in the material conditions of existence, in economic relations, could be of any advantage to them. By changes in the material conditions of existence, this form of socialism, however, by no means understands abolition of the bourgeois relations of production, an abolition that can be effected only by a revolution, but administrative reforms, based on the continued existence of these relations, reforms, therefore, that in no respect affect the relations between capital and labor, but at the best lessen the cost and simplify the administrative work of bourgeois government. Bourgeois socialism attains adequate expression when and only when it becomes a mere figure of speech. Free trade for the benefit of the working class. Protective duties, for the benefit of the working class. Prison reform, for the benefit of the working class. This is the last word and the only seriously meant word of bourgeois socialism. It is summed up in the phrase, the bourgeois is a bourgeois, for the benefit of the working class. 3. Critical Utopian Socialism and Communism we do not here refer to that literature which, in every great modern revolution, has always given voice to the demands of the proletariat, such as the writings of Babeuf and others. The first direct attempts of the proletariat to attain its own ends, made in times of universal excitement, when feudal society was being overthrown, these attempts necessarily failed, owing to the then undeveloped state of the proletariat as well as to the absence of the economic conditions for its emancipation, conditions that had yet to be produced, and could be produced by the impending bourgeois epoch alone. The revolutionary literature that accompanied these first movements of the proletariat had necessarily a reactionary character. It inculcated universal asceticism and social leveling in its crudest form. The socialist and communist systems properly so called those of St. Simon, Fourier, Owen, and others, spring into existence in the early undeveloped period described above of the struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie. See section 1, Bourgeois and Proletariats. The founders of these systems see, indeed, the class antagonisms, as well as the action of the decomposing elements in the prevailing form of society. But the proletariat, as yet in its infancy, offers to them the spectacle of a class without any historical initiative or any independent political movement. Since the development of class antagonism keeps even pace with the development of industry, the economic situation, as they find it, does not as yet offer to them the material conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. They therefore search after a new social science, after new social laws that are to create these conditions. Historical action is to yield to their personal inventive action, historically created conditions of emancipation to fantastic ones, and the gradual, spontaneous class organization of the proletariat to the organization of society specially contrived by these inventors. 
future history resolves itself in their eyes into the propaganda and the practical carrying out of their social plans. In the formation of their plans, they are conscious of caring chiefly for the interests of the working class, as being the most suffering class. Only from the point of view of being the most suffering class does the proletariat exist for them. The undeveloped state of the class struggle, as well as their own surroundings, causes socialists of this kind to consider themselves far superior to all class antagonisms. They want to improve the condition of every member of society, even that of the most favored. Hence, they habitually appeal to society at large without distinction of class, nay, by preference, to the ruling class. For how can people, when once they understand their system, fail to see in it the best possible plan of the best possible state of society? Hence, they reject all political, and especially all revolutionary, action. They wish to attain their ends by peaceful means, and endeavor, by small experiments, necessarily doomed to failure, and by the force of example, to pave the way for the new social gospel. Such fantastic pictures of future society, painted at a time when the proletariat is still in a very undeveloped state, and has but a fantastic conception of its own position, correspond with the first instinctive yearnings of that class for a general reconstruction of society. But these socialist and communist publications contain also a critical element. They attack every principle of existing society. Hence, they are full of the most valuable materials for the enlightenment of the working class. The practical measures proposed in them, such as the abolition of the distinction between town and country, of the family, of the carrying on of industries for the account of private individuals, and of the wage system, the proclamation of social harmony, the conversion of the functions of the state into a mere... So basically what they're saying is uh, these, these people who, again, today would be called probably social democrats, they want incremental change, they want, you know, the same basic things, but they want to get to it by, by slower means, not by revolution. And so Marx is criticizing that. He's saying, ah, it's just doomed to failure. It's it's going to be undone. It's, it's too little of change. He's, he's trying to agitate towards revolutionary rather than uh, reform. So, yeah, a lot of parallels to today. It's the same sort of thing that happens. And again, it's just, ah, I can see where root where a revolutionary is coming from, how, how they want change desperately. Uh, definitely, we need change desperately. Uh, but you know, I think to have lasting change, it also has to be built on a firm foundation, and that takes people uh, being on board with not just um, the people who are leading, but, uh, but the vision for society, for how it will be. People have to agree. People have to understand what's going on. I think probably even in the majority uh, for things to really take hold and have a lasting effect. That's just my opinion. For superintendents of production, all these proposals point solely to the disappearance of class antagonisms which were at that time only just cropping up and which in these publications are recognized in their earliest, indistinct, and undefined forms only. These proposals, therefore, are of a purely utopian character. The significance of critical utopian socialism and communism bears an inverse relation to historical development. In proportion as the modern class struggle develops and takes definite shape, this fantastic standing apart from the contest these fantastic attacks on it, lose all practical value and all theoretical justification. Therefore, although the originators of these systems were, in many respects, revolutionary, their disciples have, in every case, formed mere reactionary sects. They hold fast by the original views of their masters, in opposition to the progressive historical development of the proletariat. They, therefore, endeavor and that consistently, 
to deaden the class struggle and to reconcile the class antagonisms. They still dream of experimental realization of their social utopias, of founding isolated phalansteres, of establishing home colonies, of setting up a little Icaria, duodecimo editions of the New Jerusalem, and to realize all these castles in the air, they are compelled to appeal to the feelings and purses of the bourgeois. By degrees, they sink into the category of the reactionary conservative socialists depicted above, differing from these only by more systematic pedantry and by their fanatical and superstitious belief in the miraculous effects of their social science. They therefore violently oppose all political action on the part of the working class. Such action, according to them, can only result from blind unbelief in the new gospel. The Owenites in England and the Fourierists in France, respectively, oppose the Chartists and the Reformists. Section 4. Position of the Communists in relation to the various sure. existing Almost opposition done. parties. Section 2 has made clear the relations of the Communists to the existing working class parties, such as the Chartists in England and the agrarian reformers in America. The communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims for the enforcement of the momentary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. In France, the communists ally themselves with the social democrats against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie reserving, however, the right to take up a critical position in regard to phrases and illusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolution. In Switzerland, they support the radicals, without losing sight of the fact that this party consists of antagonistic elements, partly of democratic socialists, in the French sense, partly of radical bourgeois. In Poland, they support the party that insists on an agrarian revolution as the prime condition for national emancipation, that party which fomented the insurrection of Krakow in 1846. In Germany, they fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way, against the absolute monarchy, the feudal squirearchy, and the petty bourgeoisie. But they never cease, for a single instant, to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat, in order that the German workers may straightway use, as so many weapons against the bourgeoisie, the social and political conditions that the bourgeoisie must necessarily introduce along with its supremacy, and in order that, after the fall of the reactionary classes in Germany, the fight against the bourgeoisie itself may immediately begin. The communists turn their attention chiefly to Germany, because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization, and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th and of France in the 18th century, and because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. In all these movements they bring to the front, as the leading question in each, the property question, no matter what its degree of development at the time. Finally, they labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries, unite. And there you have it. This is the end of... The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Thank you for listening. All right, we did it. We got to the very end. Thank you all so much for coming with me on, on this journey, this first book that we've gotten into. 
Oh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, interesting, some unexpected stuff has, has come up just through re-listening to all this stuff and having a new perspective just from the books I've read since then on it. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I like the ending a lot there. You know, it's, it's that, that famous line, workers of the world unite, and then also you have nothing to lose but your chains. That's very powerful stuff even today. I think there's a reason it's, it's carried on. And still resonates with people, uh, you know, 150 years later. So, yeah, good stuff. So this is ju- this is just scratching the surface, you know, of communist thought. Once again, this is not at all any kind of a deep dive. This is just the, uh, I mean, literally, it was just a pamphlet when it came out. This is something you'd hand out to people and say, "Hey, you heard about this this communism, huh? You know, it's, it's a little bit different than." Uh, the other sorts of philosophies that are floating around right now, here's why. It basically is just supposed to get you interested enough to start to come to meetings and start to organize and uh, become a part of the movement. And, and that's about that's about as much as it can do in its, its short time. Because it's not actually that thick of a book. I mean, it, it's, what, an hour and a half audiobook. You know, probably take you about that long to read on your own, maybe even faster. I mean, it's not like he was reading all that fast. Yeah, probably even faster than that. Maybe an hour read uh, in print. Um, only so much you can cover in, in that. So, yeah, but, uh, that's it. Uh, what would you think? Was it was it everything you expected? If you haven't read this before on your own, uh, was it as scary as, as people have told you it is? Was it as, as um, vile or, uh, you know, talking about the, the downfall of Western civilization or any of the other uh, scare tactics that people use. Um, I mean, I don't think so, but uh, it certainly is made out to be that sort of thing. So next week, we're going to get right into uh, our first anarchist theory book. So this is your first communist one. going to alternate back and forth. Next one is going to be The Conquest of Bread, one of my favorite books by Peter Kropotkin. And he's going to lay out his vision in much more detail than, than the Communist Manifesto. He will lay out his vision for how a revolution would unfold uh, and how society would start reorganizing itself once people's basic needs have been met. One of his, his main theories hinges on the idea that the way things are now, uh, how, to, how to phrase it, basically, if people had their basic needs met, uh, you don't need to so much have a, a a strong centralized power to defend a revolution, because everyone will just see that you know the, the, the virtue of it will be self evident. Uh, you know, after everyone, everyone has their food and their shelter, and for the first time, um, all their needs met, uh, and so they will just buy. They'll, they'll never they'll never go back is, is the idea it's the idea of once you give people something like health care they're never just gonna accept someone taking it away um, so you just you do you do that but with all needs so that's his, his main theory and that'll be interesting to get into some more of that next week uh, so again we're probably just gonna do one chapter a week it depends on how long the chapters are I haven't, I haven't looked at the audio book uh, how it's broken up yet, but probably just going to do one chapter next week and we'll just, you know, just keep plugging away through. And if you have any books that you'd like me to read that you know are in the public domain that have an audiobook, please let me know. And with that out of the way, I think we will move on to the end of, of this uh, stream. But before I do that, I want to do a uh, left signal boost for uh, a few of the leftist creators that. I like. It's something I want to do every week, just kind of pick um, a few of the ones that I like to follow um, and kind of expose you guys to them as well. Because I know that's one thing that when you're getting into leftist theory, it's, it's a big world, but it's also hard to, it can be hard to, to get into, it can be hard to uh, um, know where to look. Uh, know what followers or what, what people to follow 
And the ones you do, it's kind of, it's just second nature. Of course, you you know, this creator, that creator, because they've come up in one of your other podcasts, but it's it's just the getting into the, the initial podcast or, or uh, Twitch streamer or YouTube or whatever. That's, that's the difficult part, is finding them. So the, the first one that I want to highlight is the Poor Proles Almanac. Uh, and these guys just started uh, last year. Let's see when their first episode was. It was... Uh, that can't have been. Uh, anyway, the, the first episode was just last year. Um, and so they've, they've only been around for, I think, about six months. Whoops. They've only been around for six months so far. But they talk about a lot of the same ideas that I do. Uh, they go into things like permaculture and homesteading and prepping. Uh, but they also talk about things like they had some a couple of great episodes recently about um, uh, Rojava, the Rojava exactly what you call it, the, the organization or the, the territory of Rojava, which is a, a part of Syria, uh, which their leader was inspired by the ideas of uh, a recent, a more contemporary um, eco-Marxist. I think he describes himself as Murray, uh, Murray Bookchin. And so he took some of Bookchin's ideas and, and kind of made uh, a new society out of it and kind of carved out his, his part of Syria with his followers. Um, and a similar thing happened in uh, the Zapatista movement, which is down in Mexico. It's, it's a kind of an, ont- an autonomous region uh, where they're kind of outside of the direct rule of the Mexican government, and it's the same sort of thing. They've set up uh, a somewhat socialist society there, too. So they had a couple of great episodes on that. They are their podcast on Apple Podcasts. You can check them out there. Um and, and yeah, can't, can't say enough good things about them. So check them out. They, they, they really do deep dives. Um, and as they say in there, at the beginning of each of their episodes, it's, it's important that if you haven't listened to any episodes that you kind of start from the beginning. But luckily, you're getting in early. They, they only have about six months of episodes uh, in the can so far. So if you get into it now, I'm almost caught up. I think I have one or two more episodes and I'll be completely caught up. And it only took me a few days. I guess I got a lot more time doing my job. Uh, I'm lucky in that I get to listen to podcasts and, and listen to YouTube audio while I'm while I'm working because I'm a delivery driver. Um, so yeah, that's the Poor Pearls Almanac. Check them out. Rate them on on uh, Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people find them too. Share them with your friends. Uh, all that sort of thing. So yeah, can't can't say enough enough good things about them. I really like their work. Um, and then I, my second recommendation is Audible Anarchist. We're probably going to use uh, a bunch of their stuff at some point. They are basically the same thing as LibriVox. In fact, they, they've uh, done a bunch of audiobooks that they've, they've put on to LibriVox. Uh, but they do, they focus on anarchist literature and pamphlets. They do everything from, you know, some very small pamphlets to, to larger works. And they just uh, make an audio book version of it and put it out to the public. So if you're interested in exploring some anarchist uh, audio books of your, on your own time, this is a, a great resource for that. So they have a YouTube channel. They also have a podcast. Um, and so yeah, just, just search for Audible Anarchist on YouTube or Audible Anarchism, I think, is, is how it comes up as a podcast. You can find it wherever, wherever there are podcasts. Know, whatever podcatcher you use. Uh, so yeah, that's that's it for uh, my left signal boost of the week. And we'll get into how you can get a hold of me. Here is my, the best way to contact me is to go to my link tree. So if you look up at the, the top of your screen there, you can see uh, the, the website and that will have links to all of my stuff, my Twitch, my YouTube, my Facebook, I don't have my YouTube videos out yet. I'm still editing them. It takes a long time, a lot longer than, to, to edit than it does to actually record them. So sorry it's been slow to, to get those videos out. And I know that the way that uh, Twitch is set up for people that are not yet partners, um, you only get 14 days of, of storage for your videos. So my first, my chapter one of the Communist Manifesto was two weeks ago. So it's, it's about to go away. And pretty soon the only way you're going to be able to 
re-access it is on YouTube. So I'm I'm doing my best to get that edited and and out to you, and then I will have the other chapters, uh, probably in short order. You know, it's you know it's a it's a lot to get used to with the editing too. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of video editing in my time, so it's a it's a learning curve for all this stuff. But I'd like to think that I'm getting better week by week, uh, and I definitely welcome any feedback you have, any any tips or tricks to make things more smooth. So yeah, just go to uh, my link tree, all sorts of stuff, including links to uh, my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. There's a place where you can buy my art and help support me. Uh, I'm gonna show you that real quick here. My Society6 page right here. I'll scroll back up to the top. Uh, so yeah, Zach Ellsworth Photography on Society6. So you just go to Society6 slash Zach Ellsworth Photography and you can find my my uh, unique, original nature photography and all sorts of things. iPhone cases, uh, art prints, um, uh, tapestries, mugs, pillows, bedspreads, even fanny packs. That's a, that's a more recent item that they've put out there. Coasters, whatever, whatever you can think of. They probably got a product or a similar product out that you can buy my stuff on and it's a good way to support me and also get some cool unique piece of art for yourself and I'm gonna be putting out more stuff in the near future um, just so you have some more more options for buying but yeah there's all kinds of stuff there yoga mats yeah, you know just check it out they got it's a really cool site uh, and it helps support independent artists at the same time uh, another link I want to show you again is the left signal boost. If you are interested in uh, any in, in finding more leftist creators, no matter what it is, I'm gonna I'm gonna type in the, the address right for you right now. You just go to bit.ly slash capital L E F T capital S I G N A L capital B O O S T and then you hit enter and it will take you to the master list of everything. No, oh, I don't want to sign in with my regular account. So we're going to go to there. So yeah, we have leftist blogs. We have the leftist bookshelf. We have leftist comedy. This is, this is all a user created database of, of tons and tons of leftist content creators and links to them. You go okay. Anyway. So here, just go into the leftist bookshelf. Uh, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of titles, and we have both audiobooks and um, and hard copy links to hard copies uh, where you can buy them or check them out, hopefully for free. Um, and they're they're sorted by the type. You know, so you socialists, anarchists, communists, all leftist stuff. And that's that's just one category. You can go to let's let's do another one. Let's look up. Uh, let's see. What's it going? Oh, Left of Podcast. That's a that's a big one. This was created by my uh, Facebook group. One of the Facebook groups that I created. Uh, Left Pod Posting. And so there's just all in alphabetical order. Tons and tons and tons of podcasts that you can dive into. And there are categories, the short, short descriptions, trying to organize it in the most user-friendly way possible. And you can even add to it yourself. And don't worry about messing anything up. As soon as there's an entry in any of the databases, I get a notification and I will go and I'll protect it so that no one can get rid of it and undo all your work. Uh, so go ahead and add stuff, stuff. If you know of a, a podcast that's not listed there, if you know of a YouTube channel, go to the YouTube section. There's, I think, oh, uh, let's see. 16, there's about, there's about 23, 24 categories of stuff. Some, some is not as well built up as others like leftist TV. I don't think we have anything yet for that, but if you know some leftist TV shows, that would be a perfect place to, to go help other people find out about it. So remember to share bit.ly slash left signal boost. 
and uh, help uh, baby leftists or you know, even veteran leftists. You know, you can always find something new. Always find uh, a different angle of looking at stuff, different people creating, and there's new people coming out like basically every day. I find out about some new creator. It's it's quite a uh, an unfolding, uh, blossoming world. This this online left, and I think it's a great thing. I think that's a, it's going to be a big way that we win the conversation and um, stop making people scared of thinking outside of capitalist ideas. Uh, not be scared to let go of, of the world as it is and, and dream about the world as it can be and, and start working towards it uh, in whatever way we can. And that, oh, the last thing that I want to show you before I go, uh, you may notice on my shirt right here, I have this, this nice symbol. You see the circle and uh, the the two, they're supposed to represent hands crossing the middle. This is the empathy symbol. It was actually created by my mom. So, uh, hi mom, if you're watching this. Uh, so it's, it's supposed to represent reaching across dividing lines, putting yourself in, in other people's shoes. I think empathy is one of the most important uh, human traits. It's, it's what... Um, I don't know. It's it's what defines us as a species, I think, more than than anything. So if you want to know more about the empathy symbol, I encourage you to go to empathysymbol.com. And there's all sorts of stuff from um, links to the various social medias, to people that have gotten tattoos, the empathy symbol, to its origin. Uh, there's news stories about it. All sorts of really cool stuff. My mom does a great job of uh, highlighting people that are standing up for empathy and helping build a more empathetic world. And I think that's very important. Uh, even for people you disagree with, I think that's an important part of empathy that most people uh, don't really understand. They conflate it with sympathy. Sympathy is feeling the same thing or feeling bad for somebody else. Empathy, on the other hand, is trying to understand how another person thinks and feels. It's putting yourself in their shoes. So you don't even have to agree with them. You can empathize with people you totally disagree with. And it's still an important exercise to figure out how they've, arrived, how they've arrived at the conclusions they uh, have, what motivates them uh, to do the things they do. I think it, it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool, and humans are lucky that, that we have, in general, great capacity for it. Um, I think the world can only get better the more empathy we have and the more that we practice it. Uh, again, even with people that we disagree with. And again, once you once you have empathized and you, and you feel like you understand that person, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to come to their same conclusions. But you know better how to talk to them, don't you? You, you know what motivates them, what sort of, of things might motivate them to think differently or see things differently. So, yeah, not much more powerful than empathy. And you may have noticed at the end of each of my stream, I... I I say the little phrase, uh, Lectem, friends, or Lectem. Uh, that's actually an acronym that I created. I'm going to talk about it more in the future uh, when I'm talking more just about my ideas, when we take a break from uh, doing the, the audiobooks and I'm just talking about my own theories. But Lectem is an acronym, and the E in Lectem, it's L-E-C-T-A-M, the E is, stands for empathy. I think that's one of the, the most important building blocks of any good relationship, be that with a neighbor, a friend, uh, someone you're actually related to, um, someone, uh, you know, a lover, uh, a spouse, whatever relationship. I think empathy is one of the most foundational parts of having a healthy relationship. So to, uh, I'll be discussing more about what the rest of the, the letters in, in Lectem stand for, but for now, just uh, know that the E stands for empathy. Um, I think that's about going to do it for tonight. Uh, thank you all so much for, for joining me. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, try and dig into some more leftist theory, trying to educate yourself. It's, it's a tough thing to get into, but once you get into it, uh, I will say it becomes more easy. You know, Once you start seeing the parallels between the various ideologies and, and worldviews, uh, you get a better feel for it and it becomes more, not only more enjoyable, but uh, you get to see the, how the different ideas have cross-pollinated between uh, the ages and the, and the 
the various thinkers and you get to start kind of building on that yourself thinking about what you actually believe in uh which of their ideas you find useful which which you can just discard like you know i gotta say again just to, to reiterate that that last part of section three where he's just rattling off the various forms of of socialism uh as he sees it at the time i don't find a whole lot of use in that personally it's, it's kind of an interesting historic footnote but beyond that i don't find a lot of useful ideas in that other than just seeing hey you know there's some parallels between that and the way that a lot of social democrats talk and organize uh, in the modern day um so yeah you don't have to like all of a, a leftist theory to get something out of it either there can be parts you pick and choose like i i find the dictatorship of the proletariat a very compelling idea i just uh personally am worried about how you'd actually get to that point and it seems like you know just from my my western probably tainted perspective to a certain degree uh all the all the countries that have, have attempted any sort of uh dictatorship of the proletariat actually getting to that point they may have come fairly close at times but uh, um, other than places like rojava and uh, the zapatista area i can't remember exactly what their the name of their territories but the, the zapatista movement other than you know some very small uh sm- I guess it's not even small, but smaller scale than, than say, a nation. Um, on a very small level, those ideas may have actually come to fruition. But when it comes to organization of actual world powers, actual states, especially when you get to the size of, uh, you know, dominant world powers, it seems like something has gotten in the way time and time again, whether that's uh, a strong man seizing power, uh, either at the beginning or after the the original uh, revolutionaries have faded away or whether that's just uh, never quite got to their uh, as far as their aspirations wanted to carry them um so I, well if again while i found that a compelling idea the idea of uh, the proletariat the, the workers all coming together to make decisions for the country in a fast revolution at the very least, I, I, it seems like a very volatile path to get there. And there's a lot that has to, there's a whole lot that has to go right uh, or else the whole thing can just kind of veer off to, to one side or another and it could be decades before you get to the, have that chance again. It could be generations before you get to have that chance again to actually go for something better. Um, but I still find it, yeah, again, I still find it a, a useful idea. It's it's something that I can take with me. I can ponder. I can turn over in my mind and say, oh, you know, how can I do this better? I have a lot of ideas about uh, how a small and slow revolution could happen. So, you know, stay tuned to this channel. Uh, eventually, we'll start covering some of those ideas of how each one of us can do something to uh, push us in the right direction and help push society along with us and um, maybe take a different approach than an all or nothing play and an all or nothing result. Um, yeah, so think about that. Small and slow revolution. That should be the, the, the word, the, the phrase of the day. Um, kind of turn over in your mind, see what you think of it, see how that fits with your worldview, your ideas about Uh, society and revolution and uh, making a better tomorrow and a better world all right Uh, rather than uh, keeping on rambling i think i will just sign off for tonight Uh, again thank you so much for joining me on this this journey through uh, one of the most seminal works of all of leftist thought i mean this kind of as as shallow as as it might be in terms of actual meat and potatoes theory really endures as a very important and influential standard by which uh, a whole lot of what came after it defines itself and continues to define itself today. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely worth having in your uh, internal library, I guess I'll call it, the, the library inside your mind. Um, it's definitely a book worth absorbing. Um, 
there's so much more. So stay tuned for next week when, again, we will start uh, what's known as the Bread Book, where I get my the the uh, inspiration for my channel name, Bread Theory. It's, it comes from Peter Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread. So I look forward to 9.30 next Friday, uh, Central Standard Time. Uh, tune in and we can, uh, we can have a good time again uh, learning some more. And again, uh, any, any, any advice you have, you know, just starting out, just trying a bunch of ideas all at once. So if there's anything that works for you, anything that doesn't work for you, I would love to know. Anything that I could do better, I would love to know. Um, and then, and, all right, until next time, like time, friends.